we are going to be joined by Dr. Hilary Marston. She is an MD and MPH. She's medical officer and policy advisor for pandemic preparedness, focusing on emerging infectious diseases at NIH. She coordinates NIAD's response to outbreaks, including Zika and Ebola and COVID-19. Um, her medical degree is, is, uh, was awarded um, by Harvard. She was at Brigham and Women's Hospital and has also worked with the Clinton Health Access Initiative and Partners in Health. And um, she previously was at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I believe she should be coming up on my screen any moment now. Hello. Hi, Dr. Marston. Thank you so much for joining us. So as you probably heard me say to Dr. Collins, uh, that we have a very long list of questions that were sent in by people who were very excited to attend this remote session. And I'm just going to start firing them off at you because my understanding is that um, you, you are not going to... Um, to take any time to make any prepared remarks. We just get to ask you questions right from the start. So um, the first thing that I, I want to do is to pick up on some of the remarks that Dr. Collins made about um, the challenges of distributing this vaccine, these vaccines as they arrive. First, the two that seem to be going into EUA quite quickly, um, and then the ones that are coming swiftly through the pipeline after them. Can, can you... Um, Re reflect for us a bit on what some of the, the, the known challenges are at this point, particularly for the ultra cold vaccines um, and particularly for sort of the last mile of distribution. What is that looking like now? Uh, well, thanks so much. And boy, uh, Dr. Collins is a tough act to follow. So I apologize to everyone that, uh, that now you have to hear from me. Um, but I would break the uh, challenges largely into two. Buckets. So the first is just the logistics, and the second is probably more difficult, which is the acceptability and uh, desire to get vaccinated. So with regard to the first, um, we have been planning for this for quite some time. Uh, we were, via Operation Warp Speed, planning for worst-case scenario, which would be um, the most uh, extreme cold chain that you would have to deliver. So I think uh, everyone was delighted by the good news from Moderna yesterday that their vaccine could be kept in a regular fridge for up to a month. That's delightful um, and uh, welcome news for the logistics folks. That being said, they were prepared to move forward either way. Um, and they certainly are prepared to move forward with the Pfizer vaccine. So I think we're currently in a really uh, fantastic situation of having two vaccines with preliminary uh, efficacy evidence over 90%. I don't think any of us uh, could have hoped for those results. We're just thrilled to see them and ready to uh, work with the FDA to get them the data as soon as possible uh, and allow for their thorough review of the data and then for delivery. The second is obviously a, a big concern. We've all seen the polling data, which has admittedly gotten worse over the course of the last few months, where people, even healthcare workers who are at high risk of infection, uh, just from their day-to-day -day work, uh, are concerned about getting vaccinated and potentially even reluctant to. And I think that's just something that we're going to have to keep on addressing uh, in every forum that we can. And I think that health journalists have a tremendous role to play in that, um, particularly in emphasizing the multiple aspects of review that these vaccines will go through uh, and the robust evaluation that they've already been through. But also, as Dr. Collins said, acknowledging that uh, their concerns are are not uh, are not silly. <laughs> they are uh, not coming from a poorly informed space, and take them head on from that light. What are you thinking the distribution is going to look like? So, so just to to, to set the frame here, you know, the, the CDC's prioritization uh, through multiple steps has been that among the first. Uh, to receive the vaccine should be healthcare workers, and presumably they are healthcare workers are at places that have a robust infrastructure, that may have ultra cold freezers, that have laboratorians used to dealing with things that go into freezers. But beyond that first tranche, uh, the, um, the the landscape of who might get the vaccine, even in the early prioritization, gets a lot more heterogeneous. So um, understanding that this is 
is something that NIH may be looking into, but not necessarily operationalizing. What are your thoughts about what some of the challenges of the, the last mile of delivering this are going to be? Mm -hmm. Well, the good news is that um, our colleagues at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have uh, significant expertise to lend in this area, particularly based on the H1N1 experience of rolling out vaccine. So I think they'll be taking a lot of lessons from that, and they've built upon that experience with some of the recently announced partnerships uh, with some of the large pharmaceutical chains. So I think you're absolutely right that the first tranche of, of people to get vaccinated, um, if it goes according to the National Academy's prioritization, where Group 1A is the high-risk healthcare workers, defined broadly, um, so not just doctors and nurses, quote unquote, uh, but uh, extending to people who are engaged in patient care in other ways, uh, and uh, elderly individuals, particularly in congregant living situations. So those two populations, there are uh, there are SOPs that can be borrowed from from the influenza experience, and I expect that that will be done. Uh, as we move past that, uh, we will be relying on some of the, our clinic partners, for example, the federally qualified health centers um, and uh, pharmacy chains to be pushing out more broadly into the public. So we've been talking about uh, the vaccine without really being super specific about what it's going to do. Um, do we have a good sense at this point, do you have a good sense at NIH of exactly what these new vaccines will do? Do they prevent infection? Do they prevent severe disease? Will they affect asymptomatic shedding? Um, and is there any more detail that you can give us about the, the role that it will actually play? So thus far, the data that we have, as you know, are about protection against symptomatic disease. So that's what we have from the phase three trials and the exciting data that we've all reviewed. There will be additional data forthcoming from those trials on the degree, the duration of viral shedding um, and the amount of virus in uh, nasopharyngeal swabs or nasal swabs over time. So that'll give us a sense of just the viral burden in breakthrough cases, which thankfully, based on the data that we've seen, are rare. Um, that won't get us quite at the, at the asymptomatic question. Uh, the asymptomatic disease is elsewhere in the protocol. So that data will come a little bit later, but what we do look at is uh, seroconversion. So at a certain point in time, and this is laid out in the, in the protocols, which are, um, which are publicly available, that was a huge step forward. Uh, at a certain point in time, we do a blood draw on the participants and look to see if they've zero converted to, uh, an to antigens, to proteins that are not in the vaccine. So we can tell the difference from the antibody response to the vaccine versus one that would have been to infection itself. So that'll give us a sense of the asymptomatic infection. Another type of study which could be considered in the future is a transmission study. So we've done some of these for some of the monoclonal antibodies in partnership with the companies, but we could look at areas where there are expected to be a high rate of infections, um, potentially dormitory settings or uh, post-exposure prophylaxis settings. This would be less ideal for this uh, type of study. Uh, but we could look then at uh, the, you know, knowing, uh, knowing that there would be a high degree of transmission, we would then be able to swab just a smaller group of people on an ongoing basis. So those are the types of trials that could be considered. Is there any thought in the research that's going on right now um, to the per particular risk that's posed to or the particular role that's played by people who are in um, immune compromised positions of whom there are very, very many now in our society because modern medicine has gotten so good at keeping people alive who several decades ago um, they would not have been, whether that's people who've undergone cancer treatment or who are living with HIV or various kinds of treatment for various autoimmune diseases. Um, uh, are they particularly at risk and is the research that's going on now going to offer any particular protection to them? So I would uh, split those populations up a bit. So in terms of individuals with HIV, um, there was some early coverage of uh, some of the protocols excluding individuals with HIV, including those well-controlled on, on medications. 
and uh, in part because these trials were in uh, were conducted with some of our clinical trials networks, including the HIV prevention trials network, the HIV vaccine trials network. These are investigators who have extensive experience uh, working in uh, working in uh, communities. Uh, affected by HIV and understanding the way that trials can be conducted there. Uh, and thanks in part to their advocacy and in part to the commitment from our, our industry partners, the protocols were amended to include individuals with HIV. In addition, other vaccines, uh, particularly uh, the Novavax vaccine candidate comes to mind, um, made a point of enrolling quite early on in phase two trials uh, individuals who were living with HIV. Uh, so we will have data on the performance of these vaccines in individuals with well-controlled HIV. Um, in terms of other uh, immunocompromising conditions, uh, those are not included in the protocol. Uh, those are in the exclusion criteria. Um, the, it is a population that's obviously heterogeneous, uh, but we are looking at ways to look at them as a special population potentially in follow-on phase two studies where you would do immunogenicity and then look at that and compare it back to the original phase three. I want to turn for a minute. I'm looking at all the questions that have come in from our audience, and though it's, it's, it's an indulgence for me to ask you everything that I want, I have to be, be conscious of what other people want to know, too. Um, so you mentioned, um, and also Dr. Collins mentioned, the, the concern over people refusing the vaccine or being distrustful of the vaccine, and that seems to span this time a particularly wide range of the population, not just people who might traditionally be, be thought to be vaccine hesitant, but people whose thinking has been affected also by the speed with which these have been produced or with the sort of background politics of the pandemic. Um, what are you thinking in terms of how we can change uh, messaging around the, the, that it's a good idea to take this vaccine? How, are there ways that we can, can um, approach vaccine hesitancy uh, with new messages that possibly haven't been tried before? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, this is going to be an area where we're going to have to have a multifaceted approach. So uh, as I mentioned before, I think it's important to outline and keep hitting the fact that these were very carefully designed trials uh, that we took, uh, we took the potential for um, the potential for uh, any one player to influence uh, out of the system by uh, employing that independent and common data and safety monitoring board. So even in, even if an industry player or someone wanted to influence it more, uh, they wouldn't be able to because there is that independent data and safety monitoring board that's looking across the trials. Uh, also having common assays to uh, look at the immune responses across the trial. So just little elements like that that sort of uh, make it automatic um, that these are going to be comparable and they, they are going to be robust. So we built that in intentionally from the start. But then also hitting on the careful review that's going to happen, for example, by the VRPAC, uh, I think that that was a really important move that the FDA took to decide that the VRPAC would do these uh, public meetings and um, look at the data in a transparent manner. Uh, I think, I hope that that will help to build confidence. Um, and also the important role that the CDC and the FDA both have to play in post-marketing or post-EUA surveillance for safety events and what their plans are in that area and where people can go to get more information. So there's a lot of um, just, if you want to check the details, here is, is, check our work, you know, check our work at every step and, and see what we're doing. Um, then there is the public messaging, and that is where our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention colleagues are going to shine. I know that they have been working for quite some time on the sorts of messages that they would want to get out to the public. And I think that uh, we will be willing partners with them in those efforts. Uh, I think, uh, you know, people seeing individuals like Dr. Fauci, uh, Dr. Collins, uh, lining up to get vaccinated and showing the trust that they have 
reviewed the data with their expert eyes uh, and have decided that they are going to roll up their own sleeves. I think that that will hopefully go a long way in, in helping build that confidence. So you mentioned when you were talking a moment ago about vaccine hesitancy that this is a problem among healthcare workers as well, and that's not new to this vaccine. There's always some percentage of healthcare workers every year who decline the flu shot, and there have been cases of, of um, workforce action around that as a result. And I'm curious what you as a physician would say to your fellow healthcare workers about the particular necessity of taking this particular vaccine. Yeah, uh, I think that I consider it very similarly to getting other vaccines, um, which is that it's about protecting the patients. And that is something that in our everyday lives as clinicians, we go above and beyond to do. Uh, we would never dream of entering, of uh, approaching a patient without cleaning our hands, right? Um, we take every precaution that we can to protect our patients. Uh, and I see this as one more measure that we can take um, in in that effort. Uh, and I think uh, the other part of this is obviously protecting our coworkers. Um, we are all seeing the incredible burden that this pandemic is having on the healthcare workforce writ large. Uh, and we can each do our own part to at least stop any role that we might have in uh, spreading COVID-19. So I want to turn uh, for a moment from research into preventing the disease, which is what we've been talking about, to research into the disease itself. Um, is there anything you can say at this point about what we know, and again, it hasn't even been a year, amazingly, about um, elucidating what the actual process of diseases, what kind of a disease COVID is? Is it respiratory? Is it inflammatory? Is it circulatory? Um, and I think people are particularly interested in what this phen phenomenon of the COVID long haulers uh, yeah. tells us about both of this particular disease and also about the interactions of the immune system and viral infection. Yeah. And I think uh, in answer to your first question, it's uh, unfortunately, it's all of the above. <laughs> And that's what makes it, and a, you know, a similar answer for the long COVID uh, syndrome is there's a heterogeneous uh, uh, clinical picture going on, and we're only beginning to tease it out. So I think um, there there are those uh, graphics, and I'm not sure who uh, was first uh, to to put these graphics together, but with the showing the different phases of disease. So initially, you have the viral replication and then you have the apparent immune response. And you sort of wish that it were that neat. You know, of course, viral replication seems to go further into the disease than we might have initially thought, and the apparent immune response starts earlier. And then we had this surprise of the apparent uh, thrombosis that was occurring uh, all along the disease spectrum. Uh, and these clots are not uh, necessarily the large pulmonary emboli that we're used to seeing in the hospital. These can be these small microthrombi and show up in strange places. Uh, so I think there are so many things that we're continuing to learn about the disease over time. And some of these things have led to important breakthroughs in treatment, such as anticoagulating earlier. Um, and, you know, we hope that some of the studies that we have underway on anticoagulation will help tease out the ideal way to approach that, uh, which agents that you might use in outpatient populations and inpatient populations. Uh, but it's, it's something where we just have so much to learn, and that's, uh, that's humbling at this point in the outbreak. Uh, long COVID, I think, is something that, quite honestly, uh, a lot of the journalists on this call have helped shine a bright light on, which has been incredibly helpful for us. And I would encourage uh, folks to continue to bring those stories to light. It's important. Uh, it, it's important for research. Uh, it helps to generate hypotheses and, and shape what we should be looking into in the future. We're reading what you guys are writing, uh, just as we're reading what's coming out in the scientific literature. I do expect that as we understand it better, I don't think it's going to be one syndrome. Uh, I think there will be multiple uh, types of long COVID. We just don't quite know 
how many buckets that we're dividing it into. So do you see that, and I realize, again, we're, we're very much in the emergency phase now, but do you see that prompting a whole fresh research effort, either into long COVID and, and make, or into um, the, the long aftermath of viral infection going into the future? Well, I will say for NIAID that um, that post-viral syndromes uh, and post-infectious syndromes have been a source of interest for some time, um, from influenza in particular um, to other conditions as well. Um, the so I, I imagine that this will be a source of interest uh, over time, both uh, for SARS-2 and for other infections. Um, I think uh, there was a recent announcement of a cohort study of, uh, out of our intramural program, uh, which if uh, folks are interested in signing up, the contact information is on the NIAID news website. Uh, but there, I expect that there will be additional studies um, uh, popping up from our extramural investigator community as well. Is there anything um, that you could say about, so again, we've been talking a great deal about prevention, about the, the course of the vaccine research, but about, about the parallel research into therapeutics, uh, either new drugs or repurposed drugs, um, and how that has gone, and whether we have, whether, whether we've got good treatments at this point or can see them coming in the future? Yeah, uh, I think that we've made some progress in that field. I think that uh, we had set up a number of platform trials, which are poised to give us good and interpretable data about different interventions. I think that we're all a little bit, um, we, we wish that we had uh, more answers faster. Um, the, there are many, uh, there are many studies that don't give you as uh, readily interpretable data um, because they're done in the middle of a pandemic and maybe they're done with a convenience control or, or similar uh, design or just, you know, a, a case series. Um, those can be interesting to generate ideas, but it's harder to actually act on them and understand what the meaning is for clinical practice. Um, the ACT study, uh, the recovery study, I think these were studies that uh, took the challenges of the conducting research in a pandemic head on uh, and still were able to uh, offer important results in that setting. Uh, the active master protocols, uh, they, those are enrolling, but I expect similar types of results from those. Um, I think one area where we have a lot of uh, ground to gain is in outpatient therapeutic trials. Uh, we see people coming into the hospital. We know as clinicians seeing them in, in the outpatient setting uh, who we're most concerned about, right? Um, the elderly, the obese, people with hypertension, diabetes. Uh, and we would love to be able to understand how to treat them well. Um, the Lily Bamlanivimab, Bam it's a little bit hard to pronounce, um, uh, studies are promising, uh, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing more data uh, on monoclonal antibodies in those settings. Uh, but I think there's a ways to go, and I think that's an area where both uh, journalists can help us shine a light on those studies, um, and clinicians can help uh, start referring people over those studies. Um, Rise Above COVID is the website for the Active 2 study. So uh, what you just said about different um, therapeutics rolling out uh, reinforced something that Dr. Collins had said about the vaccines, which is that, of course, we're in a, um, we're, we're in a pipeline now, and, or we're, we're sort of waiting at the end of the pipeline, and there are many things in the pipeline, and products will, may roll out that are better or different or have other applications than the first ones that are past the post. And so I'm just wondering if you have any advice about how we as journalists convey that knowledge to our audiences that, that, that it's not just that, that it's just this one or two vaccines, but there may be others that are more suited to you. Um, and yet maybe use it, you know, the, I guess what I'm asking is the balance of we need to tell people there are many things coming, but we also don't want them to wait to be protected. How do you want us to talk about that? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question. Um, I think that uh, this, the ACIP recommendations are going to be helpful in that manner because you can frame the who you're encouraging to go seek out vaccination according to that. 
Uh, but I do think it's important to uh, continue to show that there are additional trials underway, um, that they have also very promising designs and that people can sign up for those. Um, for example, the Janssen and the AZ vaccine trials are enrolling right now. Um, we expect that uh, the Janssen one, for example, is a, is a single shot. Um, we don't know yet whether that's going to provide protection. We'll see from the study. The non-human primate studies are promising, uh, but it will all be interested to know, and that could be a more convenient for uh, individuals, but also b as the we all see the epi curves. Uh, if we can get people protected faster, then all the better. So I think if you, you're you able to focus on some of those other attributes of vaccines uh, and potentially reasons why they might be compelling for an individual, that could be helpful to drive that sort of enrollment. So we heard Dr. Collins say that he's having a solo Thanksgiving for the first time, and I think it was 27 years. Um, and uh, of course, this is, you know, the, the possibly the largest uh, or most important family gathering holiday for us here in the United States. Um, what's your advice about Thanksgiving and what do you plan to do? Yeah, I think uh, everyone needs to take into account their own uh, individual risk situation. So um, I have uh, my parents are uh, older and in good health. They take very good care of themselves. Similarly, my in-laws. Um, but I would never forgive myself if uh, if they ended up infected from uh, from this important occasion. And trust me, this is my favorite holiday. <laughs> I'm I'm very upset to be missing it. But we're not going to have a Thanksgiving dinner. We're going to do it over Zoom. Um, it, I absolutely understand that that's disappointing to families. Um, and I know that uh, you know. Uh, I, I know how heartbreaking that that can be, um, but you also see stories uh, that some folks on the line have probably written about the consequences of getting it wrong and thinking that you've done everything you can to protect your loved ones and yet ending up putting them in danger, and that's not anything any of us want. So it's not ideal, but uh, that will be our plan to protect our family. I, I want to ask you a follow-up to that because I know this is something that I've seen uh, a number of health journalists talking about in the past couple of days as they review their own family plans. And that there seems to be a phenomenon that um, we somehow don't imagine that our own families are dangerous to us. That the that 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 someone could that 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 nice person who's our aunt or our cousin, um, because we know they're a nice person because they're family, they somehow couldn't infect us. We have some sort of cognitive dissonance around that. Um, do, do you have any thoughts about how we um, we make that clear to people in a compassionate way that even our families could, are potentially dangerous to us or us to them? I think it has to be about stories, and I uh, I just think. Uh, not, and a lot of people aren't, aren't, aren't going to be moved in their individual situation by statistics, but those stories of weddings, of uh, family gatherings, just having a small dinner party and the reverberations uh, weeks afterward, um, I think, are the most moving on an individual level. So I know you have just a couple more minutes with us, and so I really just want to ask you for your final thoughts about the situation we're in, about the situation with the vaccines, about what we do going forward. This is a very open-ended question. What would you like to leave us with? Uh, I am hopeful for the future. Um, I'm, I, we were delighted by these vaccine results. I think it is imperative that we all understand that uh, for the foreseeable future, we are looking at a combination COVID prevention situation. And that is one where we do not put everything on vaccines. Uh, we continue to uh, put on those masks. We continue to do the social distancing when possible. Uh, we continue to do the hand hygiene, et cetera. All the tools that are available to us, we're, we're gonna need them. We, the, we can't, the vaccines, are, we're, the results are fantastic. We can't put everything on them. <laughs> Um, I think that that's the most important message and uh, thank a healthcare worker and um, just do everything that you can to help uh, to help relieve the incredible burden that they're 
feeling right now. We so much appreciate your um, spending time with us and talking about all of these research initiatives and all the things we should be thinking about. Dr. Hillary Marston, thank you so, so much. Thanks. So our, our technical folks will take you out um, to all of uh, everyone who's been watching and everyone who's going to watch the replay of this. Again, I'm Maren McKenna, board member of the Association of Healthcare Journalists, senior fellow in the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory University. Thank you so much for attending this remote keynote, the keynote of our summit on infectious diseases. Stay safe.